More and more of us are catching Lyme disease. One tiny tick under the skin can cause debilitating illness. Nine years on from having started treatment, my life is still completely dominated by this disease. Are some GPs too slow to diagnose and to give treatment that can stop it in its tracks? I went to the doctor and she said, no, you haven't got Lyme disease. There's none of that around here, you know. And are doctors in denial about how patients can suffer long term? They're basically told, why are you making up your illness? So I think it's even worse than being sick, it's been told you're not sick. There will be a tendency to not believe the patient and tell them it's in their heads. As the climate changes and more of us are at risk, we reveal the truth about Lyme disease. Callum Culbert is 18. He lives with his parents and younger brothers in this beautiful part of the Aberdeenshire countryside. He's grown up loving the outdoors, and two years ago, he went on a hill walk that would change his life. Like any country boy, he was well used to insect and tick bites. He never imagined being bitten by something so small could be so dangerous. I've sort of got ticks all throughout my life. Um, I've always been very outdoorsy, I've always been camping, always going up hills. Callum's mum, Fiona, had always been very aware of ticks. He'd gone off his uh, Duke of Edinburgh award and he came back and we always did tick checks. He knew he'd been bitten, um, but when we did the tick, uh, tick check, like I took like 18, 19, 20 ticks off of him. So, the, but there was no marking. He didn't exhibit too many Ill, you know, conditions or anything. He, was, he seemed okay in himself for a few weeks and then he started getting ill. I was in bed all the time, I couldn't get up, I couldn't move. Um, I was constantly seeing, I was losing weight ridiculously quick. Um, I just, I just couldn't carry on with normal life. Three months after he fell ill, Callum was tested for Lyme disease. So it came back positive. It was actually on another Duke of Edinburgh ward. I actually met him and said, you've got Lyme disease. I, I couldn't do anything. Uh, my life just came to a standstill, basically. Callum's Lyme disease took a while to diagnose. That's not unusual. Around 200 people a year in Scotland are recorded with the disease. The true number is thought to be much higher. I was one of the lucky ones. I love the outdoors. I'm always outside with the dog or I'm outdoors with the children. But about 12 years ago, I tested positive for Lyme disease. I noticed a bullseye type rash on the back of my calf. I went to my GP and my GP said he wouldn't take any chances. He gave me antibiotics. A few weeks later, that test came back again, negative. The treatment I received from my GP was quick and successful. But I've been reading about a rise in Lyme cases in the UK and instances where sufferers say they've struggled to get help. Lyme was only recorded for the first time in the 1970s by doctors in the USA. It's on the rise here and the Highlands have been identified as a hotspot for infections. This is Loch Arbor, one of those hotspots. A good place then to speak to a GP who regularly sees patients with the disease. Lyme disease is an illness uh, caused by a bacteria called, uh, it's a Borrelia bacteria, um, that's transmitted by ticks. That bacteria can be transmitted to the human and cause a whole variety of different diseases. So round about the focus of the tick bite, um, over about a week after the original tick bite, um, a rash develops and spreads and keeps on spreading. And that's the first and most obvious sign that somebody has picked up uh, an infected tick. And if the bacteria goes deeper into the body, it can cause really quite significant illness. It can affect uh, primarily uh, the nervous system, um, so it can start causing uh, paralysis. Uh, it can affect uh, the joints. When it gets to this stage, uh, again, antibiotics um, certainly can get rid of the bacteria, 
but in, in, a, in a percentage of people, they're left with some really quite debilitating symptoms for quite some considerable time. It's hard to believe that a tiny tick can cause such serious health problems. And it turns out there are far more of them around us than we might think. Here on Loch Lomond's Eastern Banks, I met Dr. Lucy Gilbert. She brought a blanket along, but we weren't going for a picnic. So I'm going to take this little square of blanket material and I'm going to walk through the vegetation for 10 metres slowly. And at the end of that, I'll turn the blanket over and see whether any ticks have attached. Yeah, we've got a few ticks on this. And it's probably about 13 degrees Celsius today. Probably about 90% of the tick population are actually active today. So Scottish ticks are quite hardcore, and even when it's 6 degrees, about 20% of them are active. Whereas if you go to central France, if uh, 6 degrees, none of them are active, because they're used to the heat. Lucy's interested in how climate change can affect tick numbers. She and her team are also looking into how land management and deer numbers in Scotland can influence how many ticks we find around us. There's one. So this... Oh, so yes, yeah, they're so tiny. They're only about one and a half millimetres long. But these guys are so, they're, they're so difficult to actually spot unless you knew what you were looking for. They really are, and they can get through holes in socks, and they can hide in little crevices in your mm. tummy button. You've got these three little ones, yeah. and these were hatched about a year ago, and we call these nymphs. This is an adult female, it's the biggest type, and it's got a very red abdomen. And this is the adult male, who's a bit smaller than the female, and he's black rather than red. So which ones could be infected out of these? Well, these could all be infected, but the ones that are most responsible for Lyme disease cases in humans are these nymphs, and they might be infected. So in Scotland, the average infection rate of these is maybe, maybe three or four percent of these might be infected. But obviously that will vary enormously depending on where you are. So a lot of places, none of them will be infected. Okay. And there's an occasional place in Scotland where maybe 20% might be infected. Lucy told me about her own brush with Lyme disease. Her expertise in ticks and the health threat they pose held little sway with her GP. I noticed a little, a classic bullseye rash, only a little one. So I went to the doctor and she said, no, you haven't got Lyme disease. There's none of that around here, you know. And I said, oh, well, actually, I do work on Lyme disease and ticks, and um, this is one of my study sites, and I do know it is around here. And she went, no, 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 I'm not going to treat you. And I got um, flu-like symptoms and joint aches and strange sensations on my skin. And eventually I went back to the doctors and there was a, a nice young locum doctor and he said, oh, well, I'd better refer you to the hospital. And they gave me a month of intravenous antibiotics and luckily that did clear it up very well. So I'm fine now. It must have been difficult being told you didn't have it when you actually you knew about it. It was really frustrating because I knew I had it. I'd found a tick on me. I knew it was the right type of tick. It had been on for at least 24 hours. It was from uh, an area where I knew other people had got Lyme disease previously. I'd got the bullseye rash, which is supposed to be diagnostic. So it was frustrating, yes. Getting a diagnosis of Lyme disease can be a complicated business. Morvan May McCallum fell ill suddenly when she was 14. She says it changed her life. I was hugely into um, mountain biking, horse riding. I'd go up minerals at the weekend. Um, I was in training for climbing up. Um, the mountain Morven up in Cave Ness. And, you know, I was just, I was one of these really annoying people who never ever stopped. I just kept going. I was just, I just bounced everywhere. All that changed when what started off feeling like the flu became more serious. I would fall asleep in the school bus and I would come home and I'd just collapse on a heap on the couch. And 
I, I literally got up, went to school and, and collapsed in utter exhaustion each day. And it got to the point where I had to leave school at 16 because by the time I got home from school each day, I was so weak, I couldn't physically walk. Her doctors believed she was suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. Then a neighbor who had Lyme disease intervened. They'd seen me struggling to walk and they said to my mother, have you considered Lyme disease? And she really um, researched it. And she presented that research to the doctors and to the specialists that I saw. And they refused again to accept that it could be Lyme disease because all my blood tests kept coming back as being negative. So how was it confirmed as Lyme disease? Well, I went to a private clinic down south where there's a Lyme disease specialist and she clinically diagnosed me with Lyme disease and then she ordered blood tests which went to America and to Germany and they came back positive with Lyme disease and from that I started my, my treatment um, which has been ongoing for about nine years now. How could tests for the same infection produce such variable results? Ragmore Hospital in Inverness is the home of Scotland's specialist testing centre for tick-borne diseases. They collate Lyme tests and data from across the country. Its head is Dr. Roger Evans. Lyme disease testing is complex. The disease presents in different ways. So if you present acutely with a rash and we do our normal tests, and if that's positive with the clinical indications of a rash or flu-like illness after tick bite, we would think it's Lyme disease and they would be treated. The difficulty there, of course, is in an acute infection, the antibody response might respond very quickly. And so the tests that we use may be negative, even though the person has the disease. And so what we get is a false negative result. And that false negative result can have serious consequences. I think for certainly a person who's been bitten by a tick, with, within a week or two, they may have very vague symptoms or a flu-like illness. They're not feeling terribly unwell, but they don't have the classic rash, so it's not obviously identifiable by the GP. If they present and we test and it's negative, the person might think, well, I don't have Lyme disease, whereas in fact they may do have that. And what can happen then is they then go on and develop the late Lyme disease or other symptoms further on, and then it's more difficult to diagnose, uh, possibly, and then get treatment for it. Janie Kringin experienced a long delay in getting a Lyme diagnosis. She's been living with the effects of the disease since being bitten by a tick while walking in West Lothian 15 years ago. I was in bed virtually all the time. I had headaches that felt like someone had stuck a kitchen knife in the side of my head. Uh, I couldn't move for about six hours each night because it just was so painful um, with the headaches. So what does it feel like mentally? Torture. Torture. Janie had never heard of Lyme disease and it would be three years before a specialist diagnosed her as having it. But that wasn't the end of her problems. I was put on antibiotics that ended up being long-term, high-dose antibiotics. Um, and uh, I was treated for uh, over three years by the NHS for my Lyme disease. Um, the treatment only really began to be effective at five weeks in. Um, I had a day when I had the most severe headaches and just was in bed all day feeling awful and then woke up the next day, it just felt like that someone had switched a light bulb on in my head. Uh, it was a really dramatic, sudden improvement. Um, and then about 10 months in, I had an attempt at coming off the antibiotics and it took five days before I crashed completely. Janie's experiences mirror those of a number of Lyme disease sufferers who say it's become a long-term illness which only responds to long-term antibiotic treatment. I'm on these three because I'm, they're ones that are designed to treat both um, Borrelia, the Lyme disease mm -hmm. spirochete, and also um, Bartonella. Does it ever worry you that you've had to take them for so long? Always. I'm terrified that 
My body might stop responding. Um, I know the antibiotics long term are, are not a good idea. I know my gut has been affected by it. I'm trying to do everything I possibly can. But when you collapse so much when you come off them, it's mm. really, really difficult. Janie pays for all these medicines privately. They're prescribed by a doctor who lives and works here in Dublin. Dr. Jack Lambert believes the effects of Lyme disease can last far longer than current medical advice suggests. I see patients who are previously 100% well, high functioning, and two years later, they're, nobody can figure out what's going on with them, uh, and they're basically told it's put back on them. You know, are you depressed? You know, why are you making up your illness? So I think it's it, even worse than being sick, it's been told you're not sick. Do you think Lyme disease is a chronic long-term illness? I think it is, absolutely. Um, and that's the debate in the medical community. Most medical textbooks just describe Lyme disease as you get a tick bite, you get an acute infection, and there, that's the end of it. But I think it actually goes on to cause chronic persistent infection. And it's well documented in the medical literature. People ignore the fact that Lyme can persist for years and years. Um, if it's untreated, and then even if you treat it with short course antibiotics, um, it can, you have persisting symptoms, that is enough proof to me that yes, it can cause chronic persistent infection that is reversible with antibiotics. This is a minority view among those treating Lyme. Most doctors say that definitive evidence of chronic or long-term Lyme disease hasn't been established. Well, I think there are lots of uncertainties, lots of scientific uncertainties in our understanding about the disease and how different people's immune systems respond to a bacteria. But also the way that people's body responds to that infection, it's all about the immune response and how our body tries to fight off that infection. Um, I think what's happening is that the bacteria is no longer there, but I think their immune system is still very active, and that's where they're getting these symptoms from because of the activity of the immune system, kind of almost the body kind of fighting itself. Now, research is underway at Rigmore to try to resolve this debate. The ideal would be to, for us, for, for example, is to devise a test that could detect active Lyme disease. Uh, if we could devise that test, we'd be, we'd be made for life because that would be a test, if it was a one-off test, uh, where we could try and identify that patient, you have Lyme disease, you need to be treated you do not have Lyme disease, you need to consider another diagnosis. And both aspects are very important because for those who have Lyme disease, they need to be identified and they need to be treated appropriately. For those who don't have Lyme disease, another diagnosis needs to be sought because they need to be helped. Uh, they're very unwell and they need to find out what's causing the disease. Do you think it's possible to develop that perfect test for this? I'm not sure if it's possible. I think we can make inroads into that to try and gain things. For example, within our own department, a colleague of mine has done some work looking for markers of active infection. It's showing possible results, and one of the things we're hoping to do as a reference lab is to develop that work. Um, I don't think it will give us a clear-cut answer, which is what everyone wants, but it will help us. It will maybe 70 or 80 percent help us further. Until then, a patient's best bet is finding a GP who knows about Lyme disease. They work to UK-wide guidelines set out by NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. These tell GPs that the standard treatment is a three-week course of antibiotics, a second course of different antibiotics if the first is unsuccessful, if that doesn't work, referral to a specialist and telling them the symptoms may take months or even years to resolve, even after treatment. The people I've spoken to believe GPs need more support in tackling Lyme disease. If someone's coming along to a doctor saying I've got all these symptoms and they can't find anything wrong because they don't have the tests to, to cover it, then you know, I can completely understand that, it, that it's difficult. And, and there will be a tendency to not believe the patient and tell them it's in their heads. But what we need to make doctors aware of is that, that, that 
this is a real illness and it's really, really serious. And patients need an enormous amount of support. Callum Culbert's mum believes doctors ought to be better at picking up clues which could lead to a Lyme diagnosis. I would have thought one of the first conversations should have been along the lines of, you're very outdoorsy, you have a history of being bitten by a tick, let's give you a test. I cannot reiterate how lucky Callum is to get an NHS positive test compared to people we know who have just been left for years. I went to meet Scotland's chief medical officer. I wanted to know if the government is doing enough to combat this disease. We've got some really good resources, resources that are on the website NHS Inform at the moment for patients and professionals. But we've developed some really good new guidelines for professionals specifically. So I, as Chief Medical Officer, am writing to all of the doctors in Scotland, in particular to the GPs, to highlight that these educational resources are available. They can, they can look at those themselves, but they can also point out to, to patients if there are symptoms or issues that, to look out for when they're being consulted. From frontline GPs' point of view, then, it's about getting alarm bells ringing. GPs may be seeing 40, 50 patients in a day, and many of them will have vague symptoms, tiredness, muscle ache, maybe a, a runny nose. And of course, the, the likelihood of that being Lyme disease rather than a virus is quite small. Actually, the raising of, of the thought about a tick bite is going to be one of the most important things. So that history, the history of walking outside in areas where there are ticks, perhaps the history of a tick bite that the patient has forgotten about. It's just that, that one word, one question, could this be something else? Getting better awareness among doctors and the public is clearly going to be vital in tackling Lyme disease. It's not just those of us who love the countryside who need to take care. It's absolutely stunning here. It's like wild parkland, but it's in the middle of a city. You've got Arthur's seat over there in Hollywood Park, same deal. You will have deer all around here that are carrying ticks, foxes, rabbits, birds. Even the dogs that we walk up here, even we carry ticks. And I think it's important to understand about Lyme disease in Scotland is that yes, there are hot spots like Uist and Perthshire, but it's not just a rural problem. We've come across cases of Lyme disease that are in cities. And if you live in a city, it's no guarantee that you won't be bitten by a tick. And if you're bitten by a tick, there is a chance that you'll get Lyme disease. It's a problem we all need to be aware of. The Scottish Government is committed to raising awareness and more research. There's so much more we don't know, including exactly why cases have risen so much over the past 20 years. Professor Dominic Meller heads up Scotland's response to Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. I started working for Health Protection Scotland in 2006, and, and even then we knew that Lyme disease was a problem. But between then and, and 2010, the, the numbers of cases that were being diagnosed took a big, fairly big jump. Um, it's difficult to know for sure whether that's all because there were that many more cases or whether part of that was just because people were becoming more aware. Our changing climate is one major area for future research. Climate change is an obvious thing. I think it's very difficult to predict um, quite what's going to happen. Probably some areas they'll be more common, other areas will be less common. Um, but the climate change effects don't just affect the ticks, they also affect the hosts, they affect the habitat, and they affect the behavior of the people. Um, and when you try and put all that together and work out, tricky. The doctors I've met are in no doubt our milder, wetter winters are having an effect. I've lived here as a GP for the past, uh, this is my 40th year. And when my children were younger, and they're now in their sort of uh, 30s and 40s, um, our children never ever got ticks out in the garden. When our grandchildren kind of come home and they're in the same garden, their grandchildren are picking up ticks. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed. Um, certainly in my first two or three decades in practice here, I very rarely saw uh, Lyme disease. Um, but certainly over the past uh, five years, we've seen an increasing problem. 
And that's reflected not just here in Fort William, but certainly in the wider Black Harbour area and many other parts of, of Highland. In conversation with our GP colleagues and other colleagues within the hospital, they're seeing more patients and their own observations are that there's a lot of ticks around just now and it's beginning to, to warm up in more ways than one. Whether you live in the city or the country, there are practical steps we can all take to reduce our risk. We start with this one here. This is the twister type device. It looks a little bit like a claw hammer and it's got a beveled edge. And the idea is if I had a tick on the back of my hand there, mm -hmm. I would kind of go along and underneath the tick and twist and lift off. Mm -hmm. The idea of that is that you're not actually squeezing the tick. Um, this is the alternative method. Um, this is the so-called card type device. This mm -hmm. has been produced by the NHS in Scotland. As you see, it's got a little magnifying glass on it there. So if it's one of the tiny questing nymph ticks, you can see it more clearly by looking through mm -hmm. the magnifying glass. And then if it's the very small ticks, you would kind of use the little beveled edge there to kind of go underneath and then you would just lift off and it flicks out. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to, to that, yes, isn't and, it? and that, that's a sort of slightly larger size. And on the back is, is how to remove, how to remove okay. the tick. It would be so tempting to use tweezers though, wouldn't it? Yes. The trouble with tweezers is everybody then uses um, eyebrow tweezers or, or domestic tweezers. There are some people who say that if you use fine-pointed tweezers, they're okay, but I think that just creates confusion in the public, mm -hmm. and I think the plastic removal devices are, are much better. So I'm guessing you'd like to see more of these in more places? Exactly. Everywhere. Yeah. Yes. The focus is on trying to understand better how big the burden is, make sure that people get the appropriate treatment as quick as possible, and make sure that they know about ticks. People talk about, well, we've got to do something about ticks. Good luck with that. They're here to stay, and they've, they've been around for a long time. It's impossible not to be moved by the suffering I've heard about. Lyme disease changes lives. It's still a slow battle getting to back what I, I originally felt like before I got seriously ill. Um, still get ill quite a bit. I still struggle with uh, getting my health back in shape. And uh, it has been a long battle. In reality, even nine years on from having started treatment, my life is still completely dominated by this disease. There's not a single second in which I feel like it's not in control of me and that it's not monopolizing my body. The whole world's in its infancy dealing with Lyme disease. There's so much complexity about it and so much that the scientists don't know. I feel passionate that this is something which needs to change and, and I'll keep pushing for it as much as I can. As patients struggle on, sometimes for years, it's clear much more needs to be done to get under the skin of Lyme disease.